Good morning, and uh, I got a text from Alvin during church that uh, he was sorry he couldn't be here. He says he's just not been getting much rest here lately. So uh, y'all continue to pray for him too. He's, Amen. he's still recovering. So it's quite a quite a deal he went through. Well, we're in Genesis chapter two. Last week uh, I read verses eight and nine to you. Uh, I'm actually starting on verse 10 this week, but I want to go back and read 8 and 9 just as a refresher. Uh, it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And then out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, I want to I want to pick up just the last part of uh, verse nine there to talk about that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We talked about the tree of life last week, and pretty clear on what that is. It's uh, it's interesting that it's in the New Jerusalem. We'll see it again, tree of life on both sides of the river there in, in heaven. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not mentioned again in Revelation. So here it is. He mentions that he's got it there, and evidently at this point, verses 8 and 9, the Lord's talking to Adam. I don't believe Eve had been created at this moment. She's coming in the passage we're going to read today. I uh, wanted to say briefly a little bit about this, this temptation tree, if you will. That's the tree, and I'm, I'm sure you all have various uh, understandings about it, but uh, it's a tree... <clears throat> that seems to be concerned with people trying to learn about good and evil by experience. In other words, taking and ingesting it, eating it, in this case with Eve. Uh, it's, it's trying to have a knowledge of good and bad apart from God. It's a, it's a temptation tree. God said, don't eat it. He didn't, he didn't say there's going to come a time when you'll eat it. He didn't say, after y'all been here for a while, you can eat it. He said, don't eat it. Uh, the communication that I understand this passage to give to us is that God wants us to get his, our, our truth from him. Amen. Our truth about what's good and what's bad needs to come from him, not by our experience. Uh, revelation is what they call it. The revealing of, of God's truth uh, to people is specific and it's clear here that Adam and Eve did not need to partake of that fruit and they were going to be just fine. And yet we know what happened. We'll come to that later. Uh, it's like this, if you will permit me. It, it's like somebody that says, I want to know about drunkenness. I want to study it. I want to understand it. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to go drink. And I'm going to drink a lot. Mm. I'm going to drink everything I can find. And then I'll have knowledge about drunkenness. Uh, it's, it's like somebody that says, uh, I want to sow my wild oats. Is that the expression that was used in the old days? I want to go out and participate of every kind of sexual promiscuity that I can find. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna really give myself to it, and I'm gonna commit all these immoral kinds of sex, and then, and then, I'm gonna be an authority on sexual immorality. That's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is about. It's wanting to have experiential knowledge <coughs> of sin apart from the Lord God Almighty. Uh, I'll just share a personal. Uh, thing that I have. Uh, every so often I'll hear somebody talk about <clears throat> someone that's in sin and that they'll be referred to as the well they're out there building their testimony. Yes, sir. Have you ever heard that? You know, it's, it's, like, it's like a good statement in that they, they're saying, well, he's going to come back to the Lord someday, you know, and, and be righteous, but Right now, he's just building his testimony. And friends, I, I want to tell you that's wrong. Mm. 
you don't learn righteousness by practicing sin. Amen. You learn righteousness by being righteous and obeying the commandments of God. Uh, I see the same thing and sometimes how the Christian world just gravitates and gets all excited about someone's dramatic conversion experience from all kinds of sin. You know, I think of all these famous actors and musicians and stuff like that. And we get all excited about the, the depths of their sin and that they've been saved and they're, they're with us now. As if that is supposed to teach us how to be righteous and how to be saved. Uh, personally, I value the testimony of someone that has quietly lived for God their entire life. Amen. Many of them can't even tell you when, the, when they were saved, the day they were saved. It's just been a walk with Christ, learning of His ways and learning of His, uh, His commandments. And in my eyes, in my understanding of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's what the Lord wants. He wants you to be tasting from Him. He yeah. wants revelation of Him to come from Him, not from your bad sinful experiences in this world. Now, I'm grateful... I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm very grateful that these dramatic conversions happen, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad they come to be with us in the kingdom. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying the tree of the knowledge of good and evil teaches us that you need to get your truth from God directly. Amen. You don't need to be getting it from the, the tree. Okay, let's go on. Verse 10 through 14, an interesting part of Genesis 2. Rivers. There were rivers in Eden. Four of them. It says in verse 10, A river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is uh, Pishon, and it's the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there's gold. And the gold of that land is good. Well, <laughs> gold's always good. Oh. Isn't it? <laughs> but, but anyway, Bedellium and the onyx stone are there. And then the name of the second river is Gihon. And it's the one which goes around the whole land of Cush, or some of your translations might say Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hidekel, and it's the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. And then the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now we're familiar with the Euphrates, I assume, right? Uh, that comes up every so often, especially since our... Uh, country has intervened in Iraq. Uh, there have been many uh, battles and many uh, engagements that have happened right along the river Euphrates. I want to say this. This is uh, talking about Eden. Now, we say Eden, and then we say Garden of Eden. <coughs> They're different. <coughs> Within, visualize a, a, a land, a country, if you will, called Eden. It existed back then. Within that land, there was a garden made and prepared by the Lord. And it was the Garden of Eden. The implication is all of Eden was not a garden. <clears throat> it was probably wild. It was probably a jungle, uh, uncultivated. But with, right within it, God made a garden. <coughs> and he put man in it. He, he said, this is where you're going to live. Now, these four rivers, it's interesting because normally... It's, it's the other way around. You've got, you've got uh, lots of little rivers and creeks that run down. Have you ever seen a picture of the Mississippi? All the rivers that come down? And they, they end up in the big river, and it flows to the Gulf of Mexico. This is different. <clears throat> it's picturing a, a big river in Eden, and as it flows, it divides into four rivers. It's kind of the opposite of what we're used to. The, uh, the thing uh, to me, and I'll get into this more when we get to Genesis 6, uh, I don't get too uh, bound and determined to try to identify where these rivers are today. Uh, as if they're on a map today. I don't, the reason I'm saying that because, is because my understanding of Genesis 6 and the worldwide deluge flood, the uh, year of the earth being covered, I think it wiped out every land mass that we know of during that time. I think new continents were formed 
at Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. I think that mountain ranges were thrown up and rivers were changed or made new. I don't know, uh, but we'll go into that with quite a bit of detail when we get to Genesis 6. Uh, let's go on. Verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man, and he put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it, for in the day that you eat of it you'll surely die. <clears throat> Very familiar passage to us all. I want you to notice that God picked up Adam from somewhere in Eden where he had created him. Remember what last week we talked about that? He formed him out of the clay and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Wherever they were in Eden, and we don't know exactly, God picked him up and took him to the Garden of Eden, a garden that God had created. He put him there, it says, and then he, he had a conversation with him and said, you're here to tend and take care of and keep this place nice. That's your job. Isn't that interesting? Uh, work existed before the fall. There was work. Now, I know some of you, you say, I hate my job, and I hate my boss, and I can't wait till I get to heaven where there won't be any more work. Oh. <laughs> well, I've got news for you, yeah. and I, I sure don't want to disappoint you, but we're going to work for eternity. Yeah. I believe we're going to work for Jesus and for his kingdom and the growth of his world, the new Jerusalem, and outward forever. Yes. We're not going to just sit around. We're going to be busy. And this this passage right here in verse 15 tells us that there was work right at the very beginning before Adam and Eve ever sinned. Amen. They were to tend the garden and to keep it nice for the Lord God. He says to him here again, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're not to eat from that tree. For in the day that you eat of it, you're, you're going to die. Now that, that right there puts the, the one and only and great temptation in front of Adam. There it is. There it was. According to Scripture and every all the information that we have, that was the only, only uh, prohibition to Adam at this point. Don't eat of that one tree. You've got... Lots of other things to eat. You're going to be well taken care of. I've made you a nice garden, a place for you to live and take care of it and enjoy your work. You've got the tree of life that you can eat freely from, which means you're going to live forever. You know, God was being pretty generous at this point. Just that one tree. Don't try to know what good and evil is apart from me. Amen. If you want to know about something, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, come talk to me. Don't go try to get it from that tree. And we know, we're going to find out as we go on just a little bit, it's very interesting. It appears that a daily part of the life of Adam was to have a walk with God. Amen. And I'm not talking about a spiritual walk per se, although it was. I'm talking about literally face to face, God would come into that garden and walk with him. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> That's just something we've lost. But we're going to have it again someday. Notice at this point the conversations between God and Adam. Eve's not in the picture yet. But he tells him, you eat it, you're going to die. Mm. All right. So there's, there's revelation, there's truth that's been imparted to Adam. And in a little bit, he's going to get his wife. And he's going to impart that same information to her when Eve is created. Verse 18, <clears throat> God uh, said, <clears throat> it's not good that man should be alone. Boy, isn't that true? Amen. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, that's the way the New King James says it. Uh, <clears throat> A helper that is comparable to him. All right, so we're going to, the next 
passage uh, that we're going to study for the next week or two is about this thing of woman, of Eve, and Adam, a man, and their relationship as God wills it to be. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm not going to try to rush through this because it's very important. It's, it's being challenged in our society today, our culture, if you will, our, our United States of America, our country, uh, however you want to call it is in complete, absolute rebellion against the scriptures that we're going to read from this verse 18 onward. Yes. Complete rejection. God created the heavens and the earth, and he created Adam and Eve. Amen. Here we are, we're coming up on Eve. It's very important. God apparently, at this point, looked down in the Garden of Eden and he saw Adam, saw all his animals, he saw the birds, the fish, the creeping things, he saw the food that he had given, he saw nature, he saw the stars, the sun and the moon in the sky, and he looked down and, and he said, this is not good. Because Adam was alone. It's not good for Adam to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper that's comparable to him. You know, all the all the cultural nonsense that we hear so often these days about uh, the Christian teaching of husband and wife and what, what that entails. You know, it's so interesting. You, you've got to really be either naive or ignorant to not understand the role that Christianity has played in elevating women to who they are today. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, much of the world, it's still a patriarchal society where women are nothing much more than cattle. I, I read just this week, a young lady in Pakistan married a man, she thought he was nice, she married him, as soon as she tied that knot, uh, he began to beat her, and beat her, and beat her. I saw a picture of it, it was horrible. Went to court. <coughs> Pakistan court ruled that uh, he was well within his rights to beat his wife. Well, you know, that might happen in a Christian land, but it, if it, it doesn't go unchallenged if it does. If it happens here, somebody's usually going to go to jail. Yes, sir. Because we don't treat women that way. Well, anyway, it's not good for Adam to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. Let, let me read for you what some other translations, how they translate that from the Hebrew. Uh, the Living Bible says, I'm going to make him a companion, a helper that's suited to his needs. The Beck's translation says, a helper such as he needs. The Septuagint, this, I like this one, a helper correspondent to himself. Mm. And then the NIV says, a helper who is suitable. And King James, a helpmeet. For him. That's the way different translations say it. I think it's accurate to say that what it means is Adam was incomplete. Hear me. He was incomplete. God said this is not good. And I'm going to make him a helper that's compatible with him or correspondent to him. Do you understand me? Amen. All right. We're not demeaning anybody here, are we? We're not... Uh, subordinating one gender under another or anything like that. Adam and Eve were created by God to help each other. <coughs> you know, I... I don't know how aware all of y'all are about the... Uh, the arguments that have gone on about the Southern Baptist, in particular, denominations uh, understanding of marriage, its definition. And in that, I can't quote it, but in it, they, they use that word submit. Mm -hmm. they, they use that word. Uh, they get that from the Bible. Uh, that a wife is to submit to her husband as her husband is to submit to Christ who gave his life for her. Well, I, that's not my main point. It's just that 
You know, the world, when the Southern Baptists said that, I think it was at one of their conventions, just went nuts. I mean nuts. And did everything they could to demean our churches and our position. They didn't understand it at all. They didn't have any idea what was trying to be said as we quoted the scripture. Well, you know, I think it's because in the world that that uh, they think in terms of superiority and inferiority. And in the church, we don't. God's word doesn't deal that way. Men and women, uh, men and women and children, it doesn't, it doesn't talk like that. It doesn't teach us that. Uh, the world, listen to this. Let me read you this. This is what Jesus said about this. He said, this is Matthew 20. Jesus called them to himself and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, that's us, rulers of the Gentiles, that's our culture, they lord it over people. And, over, and those... Uh, in the Gentiles, they, they exercise great authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Amen. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Literally, he did. <clears throat> that's, that's the Christian world, the perspective, theology. <coughs> and Christ, as plain as he could say right there, says it's not like that out in the world. That's where you live. Our culture, our Gentile culture, it's not like that. It's all about authority. It's about ruling. It's about power, superiority. And we've got none of that in the gospel. From Adam and Eve to this day, a husband and wife are helpers for one another. The husband is the leader of the home and the wife is to submit to his leadership. But they help each other. It's to accomplish something. It's to, it's to make a difference in this lost world. Yes, sir. It's not about superiority. That's stupid. No one knows what a Christian, you know, what a relationship is between a husband and a wife, a Christian relationship, until, you know, they, they have lived that and they've known it and they understand what the world offers as an alternative. It's pathetic. Mm. Uh, anyway, a helper, comparable, comparable. To him. Now, let's look at verse 19. It says uh, that out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them all to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Yeah. So Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, once again, once again, there's not found a helper comparable to him. It's like the Lord circling the wagon. You know, and he keeps coming back. He's, he's got all these things going on. He's created a garden of Eden. He's got work going. He's got food going. Temptation tree has been explained. And then he keeps coming back and looking at Adam and saying, Oh, this is not good. He needs a helper. He needs somebody. Now, this passage right here, verse 19 and 20. Do you notice, this is the first day of Adam's life. He was created full grown. He was created at some age. I don't know what it was, but he was a man. And beyond that, he knew things. Yes. Now, I love babies. I love them. I love to hold them, and rock them, and I love to be around them. But you know what? Little babies don't know anything. They just kind of gaga and goo goo and they smile and we all say that's cute, but they don't know anything. They're not, they're not very uh, knowledgeable at that stage of their little life. Well, Adam on the first day of his life names every creature. Yes, sir. I mean, he was created with knowledge. I think that I would say that's revelation. God gave him knowledge supernaturally because 
the first day of his life, evidently he knew how to walk and he knew how to talk. And he's standing there and God brings all the animals he's created by and Adam names them. Now, you might say, some of you are scientific, I know that, and you're saying, oh my gosh, there's over 300,000 different varieties of species. Well, I know that. <laughs> I know that. Well, Adam couldn't have done that in one day. Yes, he could. Yes. yes, he could. If you'll go back to Genesis 1 and watch what God did when he created, he created everything after their own kind. Yes, sir. Call it family, call it kind, whatever you want to do. Answers in Genesis has done the math on this, and they've identified there are 1,276 kinds of created beings in God's creation. 1,276. They believe, answers in Genesis, that was what God used to bring the animals onto the ark. He didn't bring 300,000 different kinds of species. He brought the kinds. He brought a dog kind, a wolf kind, if you want to call it that. And out of that, we've got your... Uh, Shih Tzus and your Great Danes and your Poodles and your all your other little dogs that you got, but they're they're a kind, and well that's what Adam did right here. He named the kinds, and that's very doable. He gave names to the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper. Here we are again. Here we are. This is serious. You know, when the Bible repeats itself, it's serious. Amen. You need to pay attention. Because God's getting ready to do something. And it was obvious, I think, speaking for Adam, I think it was obvious to him if he had all the animals come by and he named them. Uh, they were in pairs. They're, they were created with pairs where they could mate and breed and populate the earth. And there's Adam standing there. He's a boy. And there's no girl. It wasn't good. He saw all the animals come by and they, they were all pairs. But there was no woman. There was no Eve at this, at this point of this day. <clears throat> Verse 21, it says, God made the first, well, let me read it like this. It says, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. Can you believe it? Amen. I mean, and he brought her to the man. I just, I'm just amazed. Gosh, I'd give a dollar to be able to have stood there and seen that when he came up to Adam. Wow. Whoa. Man, I don't know. It must have been incredible that morning. You know, he took he took a, a rib from Adam, put him to sleep, took his rib, and he made a woman out of that. Oh, yes. You know, there's a Sunday school that was teaching about how God created everything. They're teaching the little children. He made man and the animals and stars. And little Johnny, he really perked up his ears when the teacher told him how Eve was created out of one of Adam's ribs. Boy, that, that really got his attention. Later in that week, uh, his mama noticed him lying down as though he were ill. And she said, Johnny, What's the matter? And Johnny said, I have a pain in my side. I think I'm going to have a wife. <laughs> this day, after naming the animals, God came to Adam and he put him to sleep. He put him to sleep is what it says. Uh, the first... I guess you could call it some type of surgery, although I don't want to get too caught up in that. But the point I see in this, in this verse, is that God took a piece of man, yes, sir. Uh, a rib, took it out of his side, and he used it as the raw material 
to make woman. Now, you'll remember when he made man, what did he make him out of? Yes. The dirt. The dust. <laughs> right? And, and that's okay because then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So I'm okay with that being made out of dirt. But woman was not. Woman was created out of man. He took a, a part, a rib from Adam, and he created this, this beautiful, must have been a beautiful, beautiful creature uh, in Eve. He used Adam's own body to make a woman. Now, they were different. I think it was clear. They were, they were two genders. God created them male and female. Uh, I think that Adam was familiar with what that meant already when he saw Eve because he had seen all the animal pairs when he had been naming them all day. He knew there, there was something different. Well, here she is standing in his presence and God himself presents her to him. You know, one of the things about our culture these days is that I think marriage has been demeaned. It's been reduced yes. to sometimes a civil agreement, sometimes a nuptial agreement. Uh, and I'm, I'm sad about that because my understanding of Genesis 2 is that marriage is a divine institution that God has created. And I believe this, you're going to call me crazy. But I think <laughs> that God arranges marriages. I think he leads men and women together, that they meet Amen. and they become married. I, you know, call, call that radical if you want. He did it right here. Yes. He did it for Adam and Eve, and, and we're going to get into some more things he did for them when he actually defines what a marriage is, and it's not. It's not what our culture says it is. No. It's not. You're going to be surprised, maybe, some of you. You know, uh, there's a Jewish saying that says God made woman not out of man's foot to be under him, nor out of his head to be over him, but she was taken under his, from under his arm that he might protect her, and from next to his heart that he might love her. Amen. I'm okay with that. I, it's not scripture, but but it's got it's got a I think a good understanding of what happened that day when God presented this beautiful creature Eve to Adam there in the Garden of Eden. I want to say <clears throat> verse twenty two says that God took a rib from Adam and from that rib. He made it into a woman, another creature, another being, another gender, just from that rib. And then he brought her to the man. Now, I believe to be faithful to the scriptures and your understanding of cosmology and origins and all of that, that the truth is God made all mankind from this first couple Adam and Eve we're all from them in some number I can't tell you they are our grandparents we all come from them all people and just this past week the scientific world part of it got all excited because they found a new uh, fossil in Siberia a hominoid you, hear, you know what a hominoid is? it's a monkey <laughs> they, they found a new hominoid race they think in Siberia that's one of the many hominoid uh predecessors of people except this one had a tail uh -oh. <laughs> have you ever heard them talk about Neanderthals yeah. Yeah. Huh? 
And do you notice they always say, well, they're different than us. They're, they're cavemen or they're ape men or they're, you know, some other kind of human being. And the picture they try to paint is that there were all these different, all these different uh, evolutionary surprises that popped up that looked like people and they all sort of merged into one, but they came from all over the place. All, some came from Africa and some from India and some from Siberia and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Well, I say to you, the scriptures teach us that all mankind came from Adam and Eve. Amen. Neanderthals came from Adam and Eve. All people came from Adam and Eve. Now, were Neanderthals different culturally? Yes, I think they were. I think they got off in a, in a, a place during the Ice Age where life was tough, and they got tougher. Yeah. But I, I think they're still people. They're, they were still created in the image of God. They st they're still descendants of Adam and Eve. So, God made woman, he made man, and he brought them together. He brought Eve to, to Adam. And that was the first wedding. People, people in the world that we live in, and even some Christians, want to do everything they can to teach us that Adam and Eve were not real people. Um, I, I had it taught to me in the seminary. Yeah. I believe that the scripture teaches, if you're faithful to the text, that Adam and Eve were real people. Yeah. We even know how they came to be, God, how he, how he made them. Amen. They were real. And I believe, I'm accurate in saying, whenever you, whenever uh, you study your scriptures, you're to take it literally. If an author of the scripture believes in something to be true, then it behooves us to do likewise. Amen. For instance, uh, the Apostle Paul, he taught Adam and Eve were real. Uh, Jesus, in his earthly ministry, taught they were real. Yes. Uh, matter of fact, Paul went so far as to say that... that uh, this thing, the story about Adam and Eve is so true that uh, because of Adam and Eve, Jesus had to come Amen. and die for our sin. Because of what Adam and Eve did in Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden, that sin, the fall, if you will, that those real people back in that real garden committed a real sin and that by that sin, death has entered the world and we are all dead in our sins because of it. Real people made a real decision back there and because of it, the world fell into sin. And that's why Jesus had to come. Mm -hmm. It's related to Genesis. It goes very right back to Genesis chapter 3 that we're going to study in a week or two. I'll tell you, if, if you don't believe what Paul said about Adam and Eve, I, I don't know why you even even try to say you're a Christian. Now, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not talking to people here, I, but they're out there and I know who they are. Yes. If they're a myth, if they're a, a, a tale that's been made up, if they're a, a parable, then we have no explanation for why is it when we ask Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and pardon us and cleanse us from our sin, that we are. Yeah. It happens. You know, this last week in Good News Club over this way, they had five little children at George C. Clark bow their heads and their knees and ask Jesus Christ to be their Savior. Praise yeah. the Lord. Five. Praise the Lord. And I'm, I know because I've seen it all my life, the same thing that, that happened to them has happened to me, and it happens to any man, woman, boy, or girl that confesses their sin to Jesus Christ. 
and ask him to be their savior, the same thing always happens. Amen. They're changed. Amen. There's new life. They're made new, right? Mm -hmm. They're made new. Well, that's because of this Adam and Eve story. Because of the sin that they committed, God planned, even way back in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, to send his only begotten son into this world to die for our sins and provide a way to reverse what Adam and Eve did with that tree of temptation. It's a beautiful thing. God worked hard and from the very beginning to save us from our sins. Well, next week, we're going to talk about uh, verse 23 onwards, and it's about God's definition of marriage, and it's also about Adam and Eve's understanding of marriage. It's really good. It's very informative. Heavenly Father, we, we give you glory this morning and thanks. Father, it's, it's amazing. It's literally amazing to read the revelation of Genesis chapter 2 and the links that you went to to bring us truth about that first couple, about Adam, our father, and about Eve, our mother. And Father, had it not been for you sending your only begotten son for us, we'd be lost. We'd be lost in our sins. And we give you our, our heart this morning, Father. We give you our praise. We give you our worship. And our thanks, Father, for saving us from our sins. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'm sure glad we lost those tails, aren't you, Delta? Did you put him up to put face? There was no there. I don't hear you say Oh, my. Jim, I think Chip put you up to saying Shih Tzu first on that dog list. He did. I was not going to be able to leave him. Thank you, Pat.